Hello, my name is Larry Mason, and if it's Sunday, we're talking everything home improvement, and today we are answering uh, viewer questions, and if you have any questions at all, home improvement, uh, planning for an upcoming project, um, a do-it-yourself question, whether you can, maybe wondering whether you can tackle something yourself, how difficult it's going to be, absolutely ask me any home improvement questions you have. All right, so the first one on the list is Brandon Patterson. Are you going, uh, why vote yes? Okay, so this was a community post. Are you going to replace all your old light fixtures with thin LED light fixtures? Why vote yes? Unless you're an electrician or know how to change one out yourself, which isn't hard. Either way, it will cost you more to replace than a bulb would. So in case you're not familiar, there's been a trend going on for probably two years now where light fixtures with, traditional light fixtures with screw-in replaceable bulbs are are going away. They're being phased out. There's nothing you or I can do about it. If you look at the big box home improvement stores, uh, Lowe's, Menards, uh, Home Depot, uh, not everybody has a Menards. Um, if you go down the light fixture aisle in the electrical department, the fixtures with replaceable bulbs are going away. The selection is thinner and thinner every month, and soon they're going to go away altogether. They're only, they only have these uh, integrated LED light panels, which have a lot of advantages. They're thin, they're lightweight, less energy. They don't uh, put out heat. Um, I was kind of against the trend, and I see Brandon's point for sure about uh, more costly than replacing a bulb. But I will tell you, if you look at the expenses um, and how much these LED light panels are costing, they're coming down in price so rapidly that they're just as cheap as the traditional light fixtures uh, were ever were, or they might even be cheaper uh, very soon. So replacing with an LED light fixture is the future. Um, the drawback was uh, people used to complain about the light color, but a lot of them are adjustable. You can choose how warm or how cold, which is blue. Cold is the bluer, uh, warm is the yellower. You can choose what color you want the LED light fixture to give off. Um, and again, if one of the LEDs, uh, they're made of multiple LEDs inside the panel. If one is to break, the fixture will stop working and you either have to replace the whole fixture or do a little uh, jump or work around, but most people would just throw away the fixture. So it's definitely going to become a more disposable society with uh, no light bulbs. Throw the fixture away. Okay, this one from J.B. Melb. Illegal to do any electrical work uh, on Australia. It means in Australia, licensed electricians only. So I wasn't aware that this was a thing. Well, I had heard, like in some states in the in the United States, I had heard that um, if depending on whether you're a homeowner or not, if you can do some of this contractor license work yourself or not. Um, so he's saying, and I went on to have more of a conversation with him. Um, he's saying in Australia, you can't even do any electrical work. And they actually used to define that. Get this, guys. They used to define that as even changing out a light bulb was considered electrical work. They've apparently, uh, through a little bit of research, we found out they apparently have backed off on that. Yes, in Australia, you can change your own light bulbs now, um, but they still don't allow homeowners to replace like a broken outlet, uh, a cracked or broken light switch, or, or the most common one is probably just a light fixture. You want a new light fixture. You're sick of looking at it. It's ugly and you want to update to something more modern. So apparently in Australia, you cannot do your own electrical work. That was, that was a new one to me, but thanks for sharing that. Uh, Okay, this one. Uh, this was from a video testing the eight, eight strangest uses of WD-40. If you ever Googled on the internet, there are hundreds and hundreds of uses claimed that WD-40 will solve uh, your problem. This was a little bit of a snarky comment. Your house smells like a chemical plant uh, just at, about now. Nice. Well, it's actually not true. Uh, WD-40's formulation is actually quite a bit more mild than a lot of the like penetrating oils and the other oils you can buy on the market. That's why it's been popular for decades after decades. And if you look at the home improvement uh, shelves, the amount of shelf space uh, that they're giving to the WD-40 products and all the SKUs, that means stock, stock keeping units, SKUs, all the different types of WD-40 products out there, I see it as growing. I don't think their sales are down, down at all. I think they're just as popular as ever and they're still, still growing. Is your water spigot winterized was the video. The commenter Josh uh, viewer Josh Gray 718 said, I just had to have mine fixed because I left my hose attached. Um, laugh out loud, $400 mistake. Yes, to have a cracked 
uh, water spigot, uh, hose bib, you can call them the exact same thing, replaced by a plumber, you're probably looking at two to $400. Um, if you have a frost freeze valve hole spigot, uh, which is all, pretty much all of them since the 1970s, uh, make sure you detach and remove hoses. Don't leave anything attached to it. That will enable the fixtures to drain out. Um, if you have access to the interior shutoff inside your house, you can turn that off and then open the outside fixture. So again, in the winter, before the winter, turn off the inside water valve, open up the outside water valve, let it drain out. And that's the perfect scenario for winter. However, these frost free valves, the way they're designed to work is when you turn off the outside valve, it's extended at least uh, 12 inches inside the heated zone of the house or structure. So it's not likely to freeze. However, it can happen. And, and one reason it, it fails and can happen and cause you uh a water damage, a costly bill, is if you leave hoses or anything attached to it, there's going to be too much water in the line pressure will build up when that water in the hose freezes and the ice forms and it starts to kind of creep up and it will crack the fixture and you'll have a nasty surprise. So uh, drain it, but most importantly, just leave nothing attached to it when the cold weather, weather is coming each year. Okay, from viewer uh, MPL, okay, scar sales. Sorry, I butchered your name or your uh, username. I apologize. Think you should have used Wago connectors, just much more DIY friendly and also the future of connectors. You know, I couldn't agree more with this commenter. So this was on a video about uh, installing an LED light fixture. And in the video, uh, I used just traditional wire caps, those plastic electrical caps that you have seen forever. They come in all the light fixture kits. They're relatively easy to use, although I do think they are somewhat intimidating for a first timer, uh, somebody for the first time doing their own electrical work, a uh, new homeowner, what have you. So I do endorse what this commenter is saying. Uh, Wago connectors. Sorry, I should have prepared ahead of time. Wago connectors are these snap lock, lever lock, easy to use wire connectors. They come in two through five wire configurations. You literally lift these levers up and then the wire slips straight in. Uh, no need to bend or twist anything. The wire connection goes straight in. And when you snap that down, when you snap that down, it is a secured connection and you are good to go. So yes, I do endorse the trend of newer, easier to use wire connectors. This brand is called Wago. Uh, let me know if you need to know where to order these. Um, and Menards does now carry these right on the store shelves. They are UL listed, completely safe to use. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on wire connectors. But yeah, this viewer is absolutely right. I would endorse the more modern, easy to use wire connectors. I have no concerns with them whatsoever. Okay, this viewer, Dell MQR1. This house I'm buying has high radon. One of these devices will be installed. Interesting. Uh, this is about, have you checked your radon system today? So if you have an active radon system, you're going to have a manometer that monitors the air movement in your house, and that's considered a safety device. So you do want to check it from time, time to time. If you don't live in a, a part of the country or the world of high radon, maybe you're okay. But if you, if you do, you should have your house tested for radon. Let me know if you have any questions on radon or radon testing. Uh, the tests are really simple. Um, sometimes you can get them completely free from your local uh, uh, environmental uh, department of your county. And, and even if you have to pay for the test, they're relatively easy to do. So let me know if you have any questions on radon testing whatsoever. Okay. This uh, viewer Ranger178 says, I am throwing mine out and never buying another stupid thing, waking me up in the middle of the night to tell me that it's 10 years old rather than just having a display telling me. Okay, so what this one was in regards to was a carbon monoxide detector in your house. I kind of discovered this by accident. When it has it has a life cycle, the, the interior timer by the manufacturer will allow them to work properly and sense the error, saving you and your family from carbon monoxide for 10 years. After 10 years, the manufacturer no longer trusts that sensor and they want you to throw away by another one. So the uh, detectors of this style will literally stop working altogether and on the uh, led display it will say the word end e-n-d end uh and then there's nothing to do other than throw it away and replace it so yeah that was a new one on me um i would say to this viewer though 
don't not replace it. A carbon monoxide is colorless, odorless gas. If you have gas appliance anywhere in your house, gas furnace, gas dryer, gas water heater, and there's others, gas fireplace, and there's others, then carbon monoxide is being produced. And there's always the possibility of a cracked heat exchanger or, or some venting issue or something else going on. If you ever run a temporary generator, there's always the possibility of carbon monoxide poisoning uh, in your house and it can be life-threatening. So definitely always have carbon monoxide detectors in your house. Don't skimp on that. Okay, this commenter, Maurice, uh, I'm going to skip on your last name. I apologize. <laughs> Great video. Thanks for taking the time to make it. This was in how to install a Delta shower. That was actually fun to install. So this was a bathroom re, uh, remodel rehab that we were doing. And we chose a uh, Delta shower, which is a high end surround. It attaches, this particular one attaches right to the studs of the wall. So you can rip off all that old nasty plastic surround or tiles or moldy surround, whatever you have going on, you can literally strip your bathroom right to the studs. And this Delta shower pan and surround is, is the modern 60 inches, which everybody wants. It's a nice, beautiful, accessible shower. Uh, not accessible in, in the way it doesn't have a low enough lip for wheelchairs, not accessible in that way. It just, it's just a much lower entry point than a tub, a traditional tub, which uh, for many years, tubs are going away, showers are coming in. Um, so this one screws right to the studs, easy to install. There is adhesive you use. You don't want to use liquid nails or an aggressive adhesive. It does have to be an adhesive that's rated for plastics or shower surrounds, and it will clearly state it right on the tube, right on the product, that if it's rated for, for shower surrounds and plastics. Absolutely. Okay, this commenter, oh, happy days. Love the name. Incredible video. Thank you. This is very easy, straightforward video. Great job. Okay, I included this one just for my ego. Uh, Okay, let's build something awesome. Let's get to work. Yeah, this one is just for my ego. I just like to reread that. Maybe I'll just tape that one to my morning mirror for inspiration, and I'll just um, I'll just keep reading that one to myself over and over. Okay, uh, commenter Ben the Handyman 9667. Beware, I have seen sometimes the main breaker will not reset at that point. You'll need an electrician. I'm all for somebody helping themselves, but there may be consequences. Just give all the info so the average homeowner is prepared. I agree, Ben the Handyman, for sure, for sure. And we have given warnings in both of the videos that I have up about replacing circuit breakers and also on my channels um, about a section, it mentions, please know your limits. Um, you know, if you're brand new, you probably shouldn't touch the electrical panel. But if you have years of experience and you've been doing research and you've been trying new things, I think you're okay. But yes, at your panel box, whether it's in your basement, crawl space, interior walls, extra, wherever your, your panel box is, when you turn off the circuit breaker labeled as main, there's always a possibility that that's actually not the main, the first means of disconnect. It's, it's always possible there's actually another disconnect somewhere else, say on the outside of the house, especially if it's a mobile or manufactured home, there's probably a disconnect on the outside of the house first, then you're coming into the interior panel. So be mindful of that. You can buy, um, I don't think I have one here, but you can buy inexpensive little voltage testers and just double check uh, that uh, power is indeed completely off before you're touching anything in and near the panel box. Um, but a little tip as well, when you're replacing a circuit breaker, if you're careful, you actually don't have to touch anything in that panel that is electrified. You can do the uh, wire to the screw connector on the new circuit breaker outside of the panel and then snap it in. You can wear electrician's gloves that um, are voltage uh uh, proof. So there are, there are things you can do to mitigate your risk. And certainly ask somebody if you have any questions, you're always welcome to ask me. Um, in fact, I even give my email out sometimes for questions. But if you comment on this live stream, whether it's on the replay or live, I will always answer within 24 hours for your questions. Okay, uh, viewer, uh, K-A-G-G. Thanks for the video. I might be buying a cheap house soon to live in for a year or so and then rent it out. May end up going this route. Never seen it done before, but it looks too easy. Thanks again. This was in response to carpet tile installation. So if you haven't heard, carpet tiles are a very easy to install, do-it-yourself, homeowner-friendly project. Um, they come in typically like 18-inch squares up to two by two foot, which is 24 by 24 squares. They also come in rectangle and plank sizes. And online, I've also seen other very unique sizes. Carpet tiles are typically going to be used in your uh, utility areas, like maybe a home nursery, home office, exercise room, a front or back porch, an entryway or mudroom. Um, 
There's, I'm sure, lots and lots of other use applications. The advantages are relatively cheap and expensive. You can do it yourself. No installer or handyman in your house needed. You don't have to buy carpet padding. You don't have to install tax strip. You don't have to mess with nasty glue products. It is easy to install. Probably the easiest homeowner uh, flooring product you will ever experience. Let me know if you have any questions with flooring or specifically carpet tile installations. Testing the eight strangest uses of WD-40, which ones actually work? Commoner, uh, Johnny, uh, viewer, Johnny Z, just as it removed the stickiness from your fingers, it will also remove sticky adhesives from your stainless steel refrigerators. You just needed to give it a little more time to dissolve the adhesive and rub a little bit more. Absolutely, I agree. So what uh, Johnny was commenting on was in that particular video, we were testing uh, several things, but we tested some uh, adhesive that was stuck on the refrigerator. It was a stainless steel refrigerator and it didn't the, the WD-40 actually didn't do a great job of removing, I think, as compared to like a Goo Gone product or a citrus product or any kind of adhesive remover product. I would say it, it wasn't quite as good, but the commenter said, leave it on longer, rub a little more. I agree. And we have tested it since and, and done other things. And it actually is a great all around product for sure. WD-40, you should just keep it in your toolbox or in your garage or under your kitchen sink because it does have many, many uses for sure, for sure. Okay, uh, viewer, I'm sorry, when they combine the names like that, I don't even think I'm going to try, but MPL, <laughs> um, thank you for watching and commenting. I appreciate your time. How do I know if it's a damaged circuit breaker? Do they go bad after several years? I have a dryer that seems to blow the breaker after 50 minutes of drying. I clean a lint trap, uh, trap every dry cycle, clean the venting. Examples, please. Thanks. Okay, so what he is saying here, if it's a he, is that the... Uh, dryer in their house after it runs for about 50 minutes it keeps blowing the circuit breaker uh, circuit breakers are protecting the wiring in your house if too much amperage is being pulled so probably there's a problem with the actual dryer i doubt it's the house wiring or the breaker itself now i told him in the comments later i said go ahead and just replace the uh, circuit breaker it's not that expensive, especially if you do it yourself. There's nothing bad that's going to happen. Just replace it and see if that takes care of your problem. That's probably the cheapest. If that takes care of your problem, great. But my guess is it's a, something with the dryer itself that as it's running for too long, it starts to overheat, pulling too much uh, voltage amperage, uh, measuring the amperage, the amount of uh, electricity coming through the wires. So probably an appliance problem, but it would be relatively cheap and inexpensive to start with replacing the circuit breaker first and see if that does it for you. And if that takes care of your problem, let me know if you have any questions. How to install a USB outlet in under five minutes. That was the video. This viewer, Patrick Brum, thanks for watching. I installed one of these, again, the USB outlet. I installed one of these and then started thinking of how much power it draws when not in use. So I installed a two gig box and put a switch on the, on the outlet. So when I'm not charging, I can turn the whole thing off and your wires will last a bit longer. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, what, what he's mentioning here is when you have a USB outlet, just like when you have a uh, Apple charger or any kind of USB charger in your, in your, some people call it a brick, right? That the actual plug charger, don't know if I have one of here lift up, but when you have a charger, it is using a small trickle amount of electricity, even when it's off, even when you don't have your smartphone plugged into it. So same with, with USB ports, there's a small amount, very small amount of electricity and voltage that is still being used, even when nothing is plugged into it. Um, so what he did is he put a, a two gang box, a double sized box with a switch so he can physically turn off the voltage to this when he's not using it. That's a fine solution. That might be more than what the typical homeowner is comfortable doing. Uh, but if you want to do that, that's fine. I would say the voltage drop, and we can measure this someday, the voltage use, usage for this and the other uh, low voltage chargers in your house is going to be so small and so insignificant, probably no big deal. Um, but I, I have heard that this is becoming more of a concern with what are my appliances using for electricity, even when they're completely off and I'm not using them at all. Okay, viewer N. Kudi says uh, at uh, at minute 4.15, soft vents are not required. Example, you can have gable vents or condition attic, et cetera. Yes, 
Agreed. So the venting in your attic, this is a totally different video. The venting in your attic is required by the building code in your area. It'll tell you how much total venting you need. How you accomplish that venting is totally up to you and the builder. It can be ridge vents. It can be roof vents. It can be turbine vents. It can be soffit vents. It can be gable vents. Um, soffit vents work in conjunction with ridge vents at the top because it's pulling, it creates an air draft. It's pulling air from under your house. Um, under your your overhangs up into the attic and the stack effect will keep that air moving up and out of the attic, which is what you want. In the attic, you want air movement so you don't have problems with mold and mildew uh, and, and other issues in the attic. Uh, it will help with ice damming in the winter. It will help with your AC bills in the summer. So you do want good attic ventilation. But yes, yeah, specifically soffit vents are not required. There are other ways to vent your attic for sure. Okay, this viewer... The goat. Love it. The goat. You should have tested the third non-filtered water straight from your spigot, not from the fridge. That fridge has a huge reservoir. I suspect that the unfiltered water you tested last was still coming from the filtered reservoir. Um, we did, and it doesn't show it in the video, but I did comment back. We did run additional water to kind of clear it out before testing. This was a, a video where I tested the refrigerator water filter for water quality to see if a refrigerator water filter is doing much, if anything. I don't know about you, but with me, I keep getting that ref change my refrigerator uh, water filter light coming on. We have a large family and those things are now like 30 to 50 bucks for one water filter. So I'm like, you know, is this darn thing even doing anything? So we got a couple of uh, water quality test strips and we, we checked the unfiltered water versus the filtered water and see if there's a difference there. Um, there was a difference. So water filters do work was the conclusion. Um, that video is starting to pick up and fuse and starting to do very well. You might want to check that one out. Let me know if you have any questions on that. Okay. This viewer Tyler Simmons, thanks for watching. I love the over-under technique. This is in regards to a video called uh, Never Struggle with Extension Cords Again. Um, every homeowner, every contractor, every builder, every do-it-yourselfer, every handyman, hope that's enough, uh, struggles with tangled cords. Extension cords are a pain in the butt. They tangle just like Christmas and holiday lights, I suppose. So there are methods and techniques that you can get used to to uh, deal with the management of your extension cables for sure. Oh, and then specifically the commenter, the viewer says the over-under technique. And that's a technique where you're wrapping the extension cord over your forearm and your hand, but you're, you're switching every time over and under, uh, letting the cable lay at a very nice relaxed loop and not getting overly tight and overly tangled. I'm horrible at the over-under technique. I'm not sure why. So I like other techniques better. All right. Let me know if you want to make fun of me on that one. The bucket is the great... Uh, oh, this is the same video. Uh, viewer, buddy boy, 4x4. Four four, love it. The bucket one is great, except it needs its own shed for storage instead of a nail on the wall. That is true. So um, in that video at the end, I showed where you can buy an inexpensive plastic bucket from Home Depot, Lowe's, or Menards, and you can use that to coil up your extension cords, and, and you can drill a hole at the bottom, and it pulls out easily. And it's it's easy to do, but yeah, it's taking up more space for storage. I think that's a fair point for sure. You got me there. 20 things homeowners should be doing but aren't. That was a recent live stream. Uh, again, this one's feeding my ego, so I'll display it. In fact, I'll blow it up a little bit. Um, this is gold. I grew up in a third world country. Now I got an old 1980s house in the West. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, uh, Christian, um, 6920, thank you for watching and thank you for commenting. You made my day with that awesome, awesome comment. I love it. Love it so much. Um, also, I thought to post this uh, to be funny because you said, now I got an old 1980s home. So I've been a licensed contractor for over two decades. I do a lot of things. 1980s homes are not considered old. I don't know how old you are. Maybe you're very young. Generally speaking, a home is made or built to last 100 years. Some go well beyond that. Um, of course, by 100 years, you know, it's been renovated. It's probably been taken back to the studs at least once, possibly. Uh, probably new wiring, probably new plumbing, um, multiple floors and paints and trim and windows and doors and all of that. But yeah, now I got an old 1980s home. 1980s homes are not that old. It's not that big of a deal. Probably do for a renovation for sure, uh, for sure kitchens and baths, 
uh, bathrooms, but technically a 1980s home is not old. Okay, this viewer, Safe and Sound Systems Incorporated 2005 says, it doesn't specifically say anywhere in that description or on Amazon, the gauge of the wiring, just by looking at it, I would guess 16 or 14 at the most, be careful with large appliances like microwaves, current coffee makers, and other appliances that pull a lot of power when they kick on. Uh, it would be great for behind the walls. Okay, what they're getting at here is when you buy an extension cord, or in this video, I was talking about this really cool, sleek uh, power strip that's completely flat, flush mounted to the outlet, so it doesn't stick out in the room at all, and you can put your furniture right up against it. It has a little power strip. The size of the wiring matters. Same thing with extension cords and all power strips and all surge protectors. You really should read the label because the thicker wire can handle a lot more plug-in devices and appliances. And the thinner wire, which is most uh, extension cords and certainly cheap extension cords, are much, much thinner. So then you're at like 16 or 18 gauge wiring. The higher the number, the thinner the wire. They can't handle as much. When you buy a heavy duty extension cord, it's much thicker and it can be like a 12 gauge. It can handle, a, which is house residential wiring and also 14 gauges house residential wiring. That can handle a lot more. Uh, appliances to it. So yeah, just be mindful of how much you're plugging into your extension cords and uh, surge protector strips and things like that. Viewer user says, just remember this, if you are a third of a way to a new item, just go ahead and buy it brand new. And I look at it this way. If it's over seven years old, you most definitely got use out of it. That to be a washer, dryer, stove, any appliance is seven years old, you did good. So what they're referencing here is I replaced a part on the above the range microwave it was a very expensive part. So my above the range microwave was about $300. I installed it myself, of course. The part that broke a trim venting piece at the top was $100 to purchase it and have it mailed to me. I think with tax, it was actually over $100. So it was a fairly insignificant part was $100. But the whole thing, the whole microwave above the range was $300. I thought it was horribly overpriced. I could start to see why people don't replace parts and they just throw it away and buy new. As far as the year that the uh, commenter, the viewer is saying, it was not near seven years old. It probably is a year old, maybe a year and a half old. So it's, it's still newish. But yeah, their point is valid. When you're looking at repairs and it's more than a third of the way of just buying new, a lot of times you should, you should just buy new. Um, it'll benefit you and your family for sure. Uh, Viewer Nick9461 says, how do you do a vapor barrier behind, how did you do a vapor barrier behind the surround if you use liquid nails to glue directly to the studs? Find myself having to answer the same question on a project. So they're talking about the Delta shower installation video. Um, how we did it, and it's pretty simple, is yes, this product does need direct contact to wood studs or metal studs because of the adhesive and the screws and the shims. So if you're insulating and doing a vapor barrier, the insulation needs to go in between the studs and the vapor barrier also needs to be in between the studs. You can't have, for instance, the plastic vapor barrier going over the face of all of those studs because you won't have a surface to adhes for your adhesive to contact. So, uh, we just simply used a fiberglass insulation with a vapor barrier built into the fiberglass. And we did not, on purpose, did not cover the face of the studs. So the studs were exposed and we could install our shower surround. Thank you for that question. Uh, viewer, Samaran Hawaii. Sorry for the name. Sorry that I butchered the name. Can I, can I, can a frost free spigot be used in the winter? Um, like I think I cut off part of the word, like use my frost free spigot outdoors with no hose attached. I went to use it again and there was a huge ice forming from the spigot all the way to the ground. So what they're asking there is they want to take off the hose and use their outside water spigot in the winter when temperatures are below freezing, below frost, water will freeze. I think technically, I guess you can if you don't have a hose attached and you're just opening it up and you want to run some water for some reason. Maybe you're building an outside skating rink. I don't know what you're building, but there is certainly a risk that you're going to do damage just like they found when they turned it up. Excuse me. When they turned it off and checked it later, there's an icicle coming down from the water spigot. So now they have a leak. That was the risk. So best practice, don't turn on your outside water spigots in the winter. It's just, it's just not, not a great practice. Hey, if you guys have any questions at all, 
about home improvement, home repairs, any kind of upcoming remodeling projects or anything you're dealing with, you can always ask me questions. My name is Larry. I'm here every single Sunday answering your questions. If you catch this on the replay of the live stream, Go in the comments down below, ask me a question, and I will respond within 24 hours. On my channel page is also my email. You can send me pictures of the projects you're working on. You can hit me up with questions there as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a